biggest thing though, and as lots of people that will know that have had a diagnosis of cancer, is it doesn't just affect the person that gets the diagnosis, it can also be as difficult for the friends and family as well. I'm trying my best to manage it as well as I can, but I'm not going to let it rule my life. It's such a taboo subject, isn't it? Like, cancer is related to death. If you have cancer, you die. That's. But I also thought that as well when I got told you've got cancer first thing I thought was going to look after my children there is so much support out there for people as yeah. well if you, if you encounter any issues you know don't 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 suffer in silence there's so much support out there um, to help you come back I came back to break the world record Hello and welcome back to another episode of taking control of cancer the podcast from the North East London Cancer Alliance. I'm Steve Bland and this is a podcast that acts as a bit of a how-to guide to help you overcome common myths, fears and barriers to cancer prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care. We want to provide patients and healthcare professionals with tangible things that you and they can do uh, to help when it comes to cancer. And while we know that not all cancers are preventable, there are things that we can all do that could make a real positive difference to the health and well-being of our family, our friends, our colleagues, and of course, ourselves. Now, in this episode, uh, we're back at North East London Cancer Alliance Towers, and we're talking about lung cancer, uh, and with a special focus on the Targeted Lung Health Check Programme. Okay, our guest today, Femi, is Steph Ace. Is that right? That's Steph? right, yeah. That's right. U-Y-S. It was, U-Y-S. A confu- it, was, it was confusing. It was. It always is. I respond to most things nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> and Steph is a clinical director for the Targeted Lung uh, Health Check Programme here in North East London. Now, lung cancer is one of the top 10 cancer types in North East London, and nationally, around 50,000 cases of lung cancer are diagnosed every year. It's interesting, Steph, isn't it? Lung cancer is, is a really tricky one uh, to diagnose very early, isn't it? And it's one that it, it, the outcome's completely change depending on at what point it's diagnosed. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So as you say, a huge amount of lung cancer diagnosed in the UK every year. And traditionally, um, it's been diagnosed at a very late stage because the symptoms aren't necessarily there. And if they are, they're very vague um, and can be attributed to all sorts of other medical problems. Um, So it's been something that has been a great passion of mine. It's why I went into lung cancer in the first place, but um, also nationally now with government targets to improve our early stage cancer diagnosis, lung cancer is really ripe for for the picking and trying to trying to improve outcomes for our patients. And it's one that, um, or it's the one that seemed to be most impacted by the pandemic. Is that? Is that fair to say, given that we were told for so long not to go to your GP if you had a cough, which obviously is one of the main symptoms? Absolutely. If you look at any of the data available, you see during the pandemic a real drop off in the diagnosis of lung cancer. We, we weren't getting the people we would normally expect to see coming forward with lung cancer through the door. Um, and then the knock on effect of that is now that we're out of the pandemic and people are making contact with healthcare again people are coming forward with later stages because we just weren't seeing them during that awful time in 2020, 2021. So is that the big, that's, that's the bigger impact then is that, is that you're seeing people at later stages that, yeah. Yeah, so during the pandemic and after the pandemic, more what we call emergency presentation. So people coming in usually via A&E with advanced disease, which we can still treat, but doesn't have as good outcomes if we manage to diagnose it earlier. Why are we so uh, bad at diagnosing lung cancer so early? I don't mean healthcare professionals. I mean, as a, as a community, as a population, why is it, why is it the case that... Um, so often it's seen at a late stage or it's found at a late stage? Uh, it's a really good question. And I think we understand some of the reasons, but not always, uh, not all of them. Um, so lung cancer is traditionally associated with smoking, though as smoking rates reduce, there are non-smoking related lung cancers that we see. Um, and people who smoke tend to have other symptoms related to their smoking. So people sometimes think, oh, I just have a smoker's cough and put it down to that. And um, they also have other lung diseases, so COPD, so they might feel breathless more often. And therefore, if they're feeling breathless, don't think that it might be something else. They tend to put it down to what, um, other conditions they have 
We know that lung cancer is much more common in deprived populations who don't always have the same access to health care that less deprived populations do. So again, they may have symptoms, but they may not have the confidence or the knowledge as to how to access health care so that they can get their symptoms looked into and, and be referred on. You mentioned then one of the one of the kind of um, the big links is obviously smoking, but it's it's also one of the kind of misconceptions, isn't it, that only smokers might get lung cancer, and there's a, a lot of people getting it who've never touched a cigarette in their lives. Absolutely, and that's one of the one of the things that we are seeing in the last ten years as smoking rates have dropped with the sort of smoking bans and public places coming in. Smoking rates have dropped, um, and we are seeing more non-smoking related lung cancers coming through, which is an entirely separate. Um, uh, disease and has um, different causes um, but it is it is one of the big misconceptions that only smokers get lung cancer. Um, so yeah let's get into this targeted uh, lung health check program then tell us all about it how does it work uh, who is involved in it? So um, the government um, has set out a target to improve early stage cancer diagnosis um, over the next uh, few years to 75% of cancers being diagnosed at an early stage. Now lung cancer screening has been around for quite a while in other countries um, in America um, and in Europe as well and we've looked at the trials that they did with lung cancer screening to find the most effective way forward. In North East London, we're very lucky to have been chosen to be in the phase three rollout of the uh, targeted lung health check pilot. Um, and what a targeted lung health check uh, is, is that we um, get all the data from local GP practices and we look for anybody between the age of 55 and 75 who has ever smoked in their life. Um, and that's usually through the, the coding done on the GP databases. Then we offer them um, an initial telephone call to make sure that they are uh, eligible for the targeted lung health check program. They are the correct age and they have smoked. And then they come and have a face-to-face -face assessment where they are given the targeted lung health check. Um, they're asked a number of questions about their smoking history, any symptoms they have, and general questions about their health and lifestyle. Um, and then a risk score is calculated. And if they are considered to be high risk of developing lung cancer in the next five to ten years, they're offered a CT scan. And that CT scan is a quick, painless scan. You lie on a table, you go through a big donut in the middle of a room, no needles. Um, and then the CT scan result is looked at by expert radiologists and we get a result through, usually extremely quickly, within sort of 48 hours we have a result through. Um, and then that comes over to me where I look at the result and we, we take it from there. So when did it... Uh, when did it begin here? So in North East London, we started scanning patients, offering targeted lung health check pa uh, checks to patients in the summer of 2022. Um, and we are now in, May, uh, almost in May 2024. We've done nearly 22,000 wow. targeted lung health checks and we've done almost 9,000 CT scans. Wow. So it's been fantastic success so far and we really hope to carry on. I mean, this programme is super important to us, especially as you mentioned, um, the type of um, population that we have. Also, excuse me, also, I think, how many patients have we diagnosed since doing this? So, so far we've diagnosed 51 new lung cancers in North East London. There are still a number of patients who are working their way through the pathway to get a diagnosis. Um, and 70% of those patients are at early stage, so stage right. one or stage two. And if we look back to how things were in, in the general population, only 30% of lung cancers are diagnosed at stage one and stage two historically. So, so stage one and stage two uh, before any symptoms really uh, show themselves? Sometimes before any symptoms, but the most important thing is that in the vast majority of cases, patients with stage one or stage two disease can be offered curative treatment. Yeah. Um, even patients with stage three disease can sometimes be offered uh, curative treatment as well. And that is one of the key things about this program is we call it a, in the medical field, we call it stage shift. So bringing the stage of lung cancer down so that we can offer the best treatment with the best chance of a cure. Um, and we have absolutely fantastic surgeons and oncologists and the latest technologies available to us in North East London to give world-class treatment to patients diagnosed with lung cancer. So we're so, so keen to get these patients diagnosed so that we can offer them really good treatment. That's the incredible thing, isn't it? With you know, when we talk about early diagnosis and finding cancers earlier, 
is that the treatments and the surgical techniques, chemotherapies, radiotherapies, immunotherapies across all cancer groups have, have gone through the roof, haven't they? They're unbelievable, you know, some of the techniques and some of the things we can do now. But it's about getting people in the door in the first place, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I was at a conference last week, the British Thoracic Oncology Group Conference in Belfast uh, last week, which is a meeting um, of all the fa most fantastic cancer specialists involved in lung cancer, surgeons, oncologists, respiratory physicians. Um, and the, the difference between lung cancer treatment now and even 10 years ago is, is night and day with the immunotherapies um, and the targeted therapy. So we look at the, the, the genes in lung cancer and sometimes we can give specific treatments that target genetic abnormalities within the tumours themselves, um, which have a great um, rate of success. Um, and it's really, really important that we see patients so that we can get them their diagnosis. We're very lucky. We have a really fantastic team within the North East London Targeted Lung Health Check Programme, and we have one of the best uptake rates in the country. So more than 50% of patients who are offered a targeted lung health check in North East London are coming forward and having them. Now, for me, that's not good enough. I'd much rather everybody who's offered a targeted lung health check comes forward and has it um, because knowledge is power. If we know that there's a problem, we can do something about it. Um, so we're really keen to keep working and getting more patients through the door. But I'm really proud and impressed by the, the team that we work with, that we've got one of the best uptake rates in the country. That's fantastic. And it's 52, 52.2%, isn't it? You know, yeah. fantastic. But like you say, that's still, you know, over or almost 50% yeah. who aren't coming through. Are we exploring why people you know, aren't taking up the opportunity? Absolutely. So we're always looking to find out why patients aren't coming forward. Sometimes there are simple explanations, like it's just not happened at a convenient time. Um, but there are more complex um, reasons as well. I think a lot of it might be fear that if you come forward um, and you feel fine, you're going to come and have a scan and you're going to be given a diagnosis that's going to change your life. And I can't hide the fact that that is a possibility. Um, but as we said, hopefully, if you don't have any symptoms and you come forward, we can make a diagnosis that has vast numbers of treatment options available. And so we can prevent you becoming ill further down the line. And I think that's really important. Um, we have great teams in the various hospitals that work in North East London and see these patients after we've done their initial scans. And they are absolutely there to support them through any tests and, and treatments that they will have. Um, and so whilst I understand that fear may be one of the main drivers, um, I hope that we can reassure patients that it would be much better to come and have your targeted lung health check and get a diagnosis at an early stage than to come and see us in a couple of years time when things are slightly slightly more tricky. In terms of the pathway, the, the lung pathway is quite tricky. It, it's a complex pathway where patients go back and forth with um, different, various different tests. The targeted approach is much more, right, okay, this patient has a, high, um, a, higher, um, a higher risk of a specific cancer. Do you, do you, I mean, how, do you, how have you found that? So I think um, the targeted lung health check um, is fantastic in that it, it uses um, tested screening tools to identify your risk of having cancer over a certain period of time and then we, we decide whether or not to scan based on what risk you have. Um, a CT scan is the gold standard of investigations for a lung cancer. And if we don't have targeted lung health checks, as Femi has said, patients can be going back and forth to GPs, even to hospitals, with symptoms that could be cancer. In the vast majority of cases, they won't be cancer, but they could be. Um, and sometimes it can take a while to get that test. Um, so we have the targeted lung health check program targeting a high risk population, people who have been smokers, and offering them a test that is they don't need to jump through any hoops. They don't need to go and see anybody else. They don't need to have seen their GP. They don't need to have seen a hospital. They just come, have the check, and if they meet, meet the, the, the risk um, level, they then get the CT scan. Um, they will, of course, have to go and have further tests when they are referred to hospital to investigate yeah. a possible lung cancer diagnosis, and that can take some time. But again, the hospitals are... Uh, working extremely hard to make sure that people get 
get their tests and their diagnosis as quickly as possible. You sort of touched on it a little bit there in terms of the role of GPs in, mm. in lung cancer. It strikes me lung cancer is a very difficult one for them to deal with. I think GPs are working extremely hard um, and have had a really, really awful time in the last few years. Um, and I think they're to be commended for all the work that they do to look after their patients. But lung cancer is very tricky to diagnose um, because, as I say, patients don't necessarily have symptoms. And if they do, they're very vague and they can be, they can be um, mistaken for other conditions quite understandably. So I think the GPs are doing a fantastic job, um, but we know that lung cancer is tricky to diagnose and this is a programme that allows us to, to, to take that, um, to, to, to make that easier. Um, and it doesn't, need, it doesn't require the GPs to, to see the patients. Um, the GPs do get some work from our programme afterwards because we find other things. We don't just scan the lungs, we find other things. and. Uh, the G that does generate work for the GPs and we are aware of that um, but overall it's so important for our patients and the other thing is that we don't just diagnose lung cancer I think that's really important we f have found a number of other really important and very serious health problems that patients were completely unaware of by doing this program as well so lung cancer is the main reason we do it but we are also finding other things too. What, what other common themes have you seen? Um, so one of the things that we have seen is um, people whose blood vessels in their bodies are far too wide. Um, and uh, we've had five patients who have had life-threateningly enlarged blood vessels that they were completely unaware about, diagnosed through our programme and who have gone on to have surgery within a matter of days or weeks because they've come and had a CT scan with us. Uh, more common things that we find um, are um, changes to the lungs related to smoking. Um, that's called emphysema. Now, not everybody with emphysema has any symptoms or needs any treatment, but it can lead to a diagnosis of COPD, which is smoking-related lung disease. And um, we know that there are up to a million people living in the UK who have undiagnosed COPD. And so this program can help bring these people forward and get them a diagnosis and get them some treatment for their symptoms. I, I asked someone uh, up in Manchester a while ago, uh, what would be the game changer for lung cancer? And he said, ban smoking, mm -hmm. which is obviously, you know, a lovely, a lovely aim for us non, you know, those non-smokers, mm -hmm. but it's probably not realistic, is it? Well, I think uh, I, I agree, um, ban smoking, and the government has just passed some legislation to try and uh, enact that over a long period of time by gradually raising, raising yeah. the age at which you can buy cigarettes, um, which I commend and I'm very much in favour of. I know there are people who, who think that's probably a step too far, but smoking is the only substance, smoking tobacco is the only habit, I suppose I'll say, that can kill you if used as directed. Um, so, you know, people talk about alcohol, but people who drink alcohol in small amounts aren't going to go on to develop serious health problems. But people who smoke as directed w are at risk of serious medical conditions, including lung cancer. Um, and I think it really is vitally important that we tackle that. I mean, that aside, a ban of smoking aside, what else would kind of shift the dial with lung cancer? Is there anything that the general population can do? Is there anything that yeah, the alliance could do? You know, what else would shift the dial? So we have to look at the, uh, all the causes of lung cancer. Um, smoking is obviously the one that's most known about. Um, the other things that we have to look at are um, air pollution um, has been linked with an increase in non-smoking related lung cancer. Um, and again, um, it's, it's no coincidence that um, our population, which is a deprived population, seven out of the ten areas with the highest amounts of air pollution are in northeast London. Um, and so that is something that really needs to be looked at and driven forward um, because it is causing a lot of problems, not just with lung cancer, but also with respiratory disease in general. Um, I think the main thing with lung cancer, it's going, you're never going to stop lung cancer from happening, but by getting good uptake with our screening programme, we can diagnose it at an early stage and offer, offer treatment. Uh, what's the thought with the age uh, grouping that you've got currently? And could it, you know, could it be extended to people in their 40s and 30s? So I think it's been looked at quite carefully across, um, across 
uh, the UK, but also looking at the screening trials that have been done in other countries. Um, and everything that we do is about striking a balance. So if we were to reduce the age limit at which people could start to participate, at the moment it's 55, the chances of you meeting the threshold of risk of developing lung cancer in the next five to 10 years, I think we would be, we would be offering people targeted lung health checks, but we wouldn't be scanning enough people. Yeah. Um, and again, we, we're using the latest technology in CT scans, so low doses of radiation, but if you start scanning people earlier, you're then going to be doing more, potentially more CT scans over their lifetime, which can carry its own risk. So there is a reason why the 55 to 75 um, age range has been selected, because they feel that that's the, the sweet spot to, to, to pick up these patients. But having said that, we also have to acknowledge that the current targeted lung health check programme doesn't do anything to address those people who are at risk of developing lung cancer for reasons other than smoking. And that is something that needs to be looked at but requires more uh, research uh, going forward. Just going back into, this, uh, into the smoking question, um, aside from a ban, is there anything that we could be doing more to uh, uh, discourage people from smoking, but particularly uh, young people? What's, uh, uh, you know, what's the role of vapes here? I know vapes originally to get people off off tobacco, are you seeing a pattern where people are using them and then perhaps it's a gateway into smoking? Yeah, so I think that is a real concern and there was um, data published, I think only last week, that showed that smoking rates in young women, particularly so young middle class women, are going up for the first time in the, in the last 10 years and that's a real concern. Um, vapes, I think, can be a really useful tool to help people get off cigarettes, but I have I've always had very uh, real concerns about um, children starting um, vaping and becoming addicted to nicotine, because that's what smoking is, it's a nicotine addiction. Um, and I think there can be a lot of stigma around smoking, but people who are smoking are addicted to nicotine. Nicotine is more addictive than heroin. It's extremely difficult to stop smoking. And I think anything that we can do to get people off tobacco, because it's all the other components of tobacco and smoking that are causing the problems, uh, is fantastic. But marketing bubblegum flavoured vaping fluid to young children who have an entire lifetime ahead of them where they may end up addicted and highly addicted to a highly addicted subst addictive substance is a real concern. Is there enough work being done around vaping then? Because it's, I mean, you see, you see it everywhere, don't you? We have vaping, uh, vaping shops in the town where I live and, you know, full of kids buying different, different, like you say, bubblegum, um, you know, all different colours and flavors and things it feels like the marketing is really directed at if not kids but younger people absolutely i completely agree and again it's no coincidence that a lot of the vaping companies are owned by the tobacco industry and they have seen a gap in the market and they're losing money with their marketing of cigarettes and so they've identified another revenue stream um, and they're very experienced at marketing um, and obviously in the past um, there has been government legislation to make the packaging of uh, cigarettes plain to to make them less attractive to people um, but no such legislation exists when it comes to vapes and vaping fluid and the the, the sort of um, tools that you use to deliver the vape um, and I think that needs to be looked at as well. I think the whole the whole um, question of vaping is very much in the spotlight and I think people are trying to, to, to work out how best to take it forward but yes there is more yeah, there's to a lot be done. Of questions around vaping aren't there because I don't well, I mean you correct me if I'm wrong but it feels like we haven't really got to grips with whether or not it's in of itself bad for you or we're not quite there with understanding exactly the impact of it. No, absolutely. And it is a relatively new technology. I know it's been around for at least sort of 10 years, but it is relatively new in the grand scheme of things. And there isn't enough uh, data available for us to know what the long term effects of vaping are. But just from a very basic perspective, it can't be good to be inhaling substances into your lungs that don't really belong there. Um, but we, we're in, in medicine and in the scientific community, we like evidence and proof and so there are people far more intelligent than me working on that. Vaping leads to nicotine addiction. That's, that's, what, it's, that's what it's there for. Um, and so it, it addicts people and then they have to continue to vape. 
the, the general consensus at the moment is that it's a very useful tool to help people to stop smoking, but we would still encourage people to eventually stop vaping as well. Um, but children should not be targeted in terms of marketing of vapes because you are addicting young people to a highly addictive substance for the rest of their life. And I think one of the things I neglected to mention when we were talking about the targeted lung health check program is that people who come to have a targeted lung health check program uh, check are offered a referral to local smoking cessation services. So, um, um, and it is extremely important that we use any and every opportunity available to help people to stop smoking. They have to be ready to stop smoking and that can be a real challenge. Um, but people are able to access smoking cessation advice and support through the Targeted Lung Health Check programme. What else can people do uh, to improve the health or take care of their lungs, you know, aside from stopping smoking? Is there anything else that, you know, somebody listening can do to, you know, we're not going to, um, as you say, you know, lung cancer and many cancers, we can't stop it. We can't, you know, totally prevent ourselves from getting it. But is there anything else that we can do to, uh, uh, to in, you know, take care of our lungs, uh, decrease our chances of getting lung cancer? Yeah, um, so I think, as you say, cancer is one of the consequences of getting older. Um, and as we live for longer, we're more at risk of developing health problems through our life. I think I'm very much about balance. And so I think the most important thing that people can do for their overall health, but also for their lung health, is do their very best to live a healthy and balanced life. Um, so not smoking, um, moderating things like alcohol, looking at um, obesity and weight management is very important and also being physically active is extremely important. There are things that as a society we can do to improve our lung health but it's very difficult for individuals to do and that is very much looking at things like air pollution um, and that is something that that is I know a, a uh, a hot topic of debate in terms of global warming and our commitments as a, as a country to uh, climate change. Um, and so I think that is very difficult for an individual to, to do something about. But again, we know that pollution causes problems for lung health and it only uh, gets worse as we get older because we've been breathing polluted air for longer. Obviously, the targeted lung health check program is probably only one part of the puzzle. I imagine there's a lot more going on across North East London to uh, tackle some of the health inequalities linked to lung cancer, tackle lung cancer itself. Uh, what else is going on in this part of London to tackle lung cancer? So I know that there are um, innovations being um, rolled out in North East London to try and improve um, things like chest x-ray reporting, so using artificial intelligence to help with x-ray reporting, flagging x-rays that might be abnormal, early so that they are um, the, the person who requested the x-ray knows that there's a problem and can refer on appropriately. Um, within St. Bart's Hospital, where I am based as a respiratory doctor, um, again, looking and investing in acquiring the latest technology so that we can offer the best treatments so uh, patients have good outcomes and ho can hopefully live for a long time after their cancer diagnosis. And that's in, in terms of robots to help perform the most precise operations, um, research into the, the latest and best uh, cancer treatments like chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and what we call targeted treatments for lung cancer. So there's loads of work going into all of these different areas from the diagnosis, so targeted lung health check programs and AI for chest x-rays, all the way through to helping us make that diagnosis and then offer the best treatment. So there's, there's lots happening, Steve, in, in North East London. Um, so again, the work that we're doing with our prevention work that we're doing in, as a prime example, where we're working with Public Health England, um, a lot of our campaigns that are linked. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work happening around that as well. Um, also, um, some of the work that we're doing around even our pathways, um, again, ensuring that our pathways are much more streamlined um, and also working with other, other charities and various different groups is, is also a, a key part. So it's not specifically, you know, targeted long health check, but it's all, it's all related as well. Um, so again, the work around um, how we reach our engagement piece of work that we've, we've spoken about in various different podcasts, um, that's crucial because again, to, 
to just ensure that we do have the engagement for patients to come forward and have their targeted lung health check, especially in a very diverse um, um, community, is is vital to 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 assist in this as well. And I guess you know we've uh, we've spent our morning uh, today at Maggie's, haven't we? <clears throat> uh, Maggie's Barts, and I think the you know, the work we talked about there, uh, uh, the prehab work you know, goes across all cancer types, doesn't it? I think that's absolutely. equally as important for this. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. So, you know, for the, for the patients that are diagnosed and are going to require treatment, again, you know, the prehab, you know, supporting them uh, um, psychologically, practically, um, and in all sorts of ways is, is also crucial as well. This is the right word, but it feels like a exciting uh, world to be in lung cancer right now, just uh, given the... Yeah, the progress that you're making in terms of treatments, surgical techniques, like you say, all the different immunotherapies and x-ray techniques and that kind of thing. It feels like it's a, it's a really moving picture at the moment. Absolutely. I think it is a, a really exciting time because, as, as we've talked about, historically lung cancer, it was, it was a really horrible diagnosis to get and we found it very difficult to treat patients. And that has changed completely in the last decade and um, to be part of that is really exciting but also we know that we're, we're not happy with how things are and we're really um, really uh, excited to try and make these improvements because at the heart of it are our patients and we want to do the absolute best for our patients and we're really working very hard as a, as a community to, to make those improvements for our patients. Steph I'm, I'm 43 I don't, I don't, I don't smoke. Never have done. But if I did, if I'd smoked for thirty, well, thirty years would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? 20, not, not, not really. <laughs> Twenty-five, thirty years, yeah. maybe then. Um, and I thought to myself, I'd, I'd, you know, I don't qualify for this check. Cause it's, at, it's at fifty-five, uh, but I'd love to be checked. Uh, what are my options? So. Um the targeted lung health check program is for people aged fifty-five to seventy-five, um, but. It's never too early or too late to stop smoking. And there is lots of advice and support around for people of any age who, who smoke. Um, and it is local. So you can, um, if you, you Google stop smoking and you put your borough in, um, you can, it will come up with your local stop smoking service. And I'm sure if you go to the Cancer Alliance website, all the information about the local stop smoking services are available there as well. So it's local and it's free and there are different types of support available depending on what you prefer. So sometimes there is group support available and some people find a real benefit from going to a group setting to help them stop smoking, but there's also individual support too. And there are lots of different ways that we can help you to stop smoking, um, be it through things like nicotine patches um, and other forms of what we call nicotine replacement therapy, um, vapes and e-cigarettes as well. Um, and so I would really encourage anybody who currently smokes who thinks, well, oh, maybe it's time I stopped to, to look at their local stop smoking services. And it's not just good for your health, but it's good for your pocket as well, because smoking is an extremely expensive habit. OK, Steph, just uh, one to finish then. What are the symptoms of lung cancer? And if you are experiencing any of these symptoms, what should you do? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, so the most common symptoms of lung cancer would be a cough. Um, lots of people have a cough when they have an infection, but it's a cough that doesn't go away after three weeks. Uh, you should go and see your GP um, and see whether you need any tests, such as a chest X-ray, to help understand why you might still be coughing. Other symptoms that can happen with lung cancer is some people can get a bit of blood in their spit when they cough. Um, they can be losing weight for reasons they can't explain over a period of time. Um, and any change in your in your voice um, can also should also mean that you go and see your GP. Um, other symptoms uh, such as pain um, anywhere in the chest should always um, prompt you to go and see your GP as well. But the main symptoms that we, we see with people who have lung cancer are a cough that won't go away, a change in your breathing. Some people have long-standing breathing problems, but if something has changed and doesn't get better with your usual treatments, again, you should go and see your GP so that they can organise any other tests that might be necessary. And the important thing to say is that the GPs want to see you, don't they? GPs absolutely want to see their patients, um, and particularly patients who have symptoms that could be related to a cancer. GPs really really want to see their patients and they will refer patients, if appropriate, to the hospital for more tests.
thanks so much to Femi and thanks to Steph uh, for giving us such an insight into uh, the work going on in, in North East London on lung cancer, but also the broader picture on lung cancer and why it's really important that we get people uh, into doctor surgeries, into hospitals as quick as we can. And why it's important that if you're listening to this and there's any symptoms that you're worrying about, uh, any persistent coughs, any of the other things that Steph was talking about, you go and see your GP. GPs want to see you. Uh, and if that's the only thing you take from this podcast, uh, then that's job done. We will see you back here again next week uh, for another episode of Taking Control of Cancer. Cancer.